Welcome back to the second part of this three-part introduction to detective fiction, which forms part of the third year core course in English literature at the University of Greenwich. My name is Professor Andrew King. I'll be taking you through the remainder of this course, as well as, of course, this current lecture. In this part of the lecture, I want to be focusing mainly on the idea of time in detective fiction. Time is incredibly important. How time is organized in detective fiction is fundamental to the nature of detective fiction. Um, as you see, now time is one of the six key terms that I introduced in part one of this uh, introduction. Um, it's so important here, I'm going to block it out. I'm going to use instead a symbol for it, a pretty obvious one, I think. That is the Newgate clock. Um, what I will be doing throughout the remainder of these 20 minutes is to take apart this structure of text, time, detection, archive, game, and reader, and recombine those elements in various ways. But at the end, we'll see them combined all together in a new way, and I hope this new combination of uh, the key terms will have significance for you. For now, though, I want to return to the idea of the game, like the game of drafts. Here, we've caught, we're talking about a withholding game, a game between the narrator and the reader. Dennis Porter's The Pursuit of Crime is one of the fundamental uh, texts for the study of detective fiction. I recommend uh, that anyone who's interested in this should read it. It's very easy to read, in fact. And Dennis Porter suggests that the strong reliance on withholding information and the stimulation of our desire as readers to find the information and thus to establish meaning is core to the whole genre. Dennis Porter sees the reader's desire to know, our desire to know, as what he calls the structuring force of detective fiction in general. However, is that really a just detective fiction that operates like that? I'm not entirely sure. Look at this. Now, I hope you'll forgive me, but I'm going to play a little game with you as the audience. If you can imagine me as the narrator and yourselves as readers, think about what's happening now. The withholding game. Have you guessed yet what's happening? Can you predict what's going to go on? It's a bit annoying if I delay too long, isn't it? Withholding and the relationship to time, of course, creates text, but also withholding, I think, is fundamental to the game of detection, even if text necessarily exists in relation to time. In detective fiction, I think this relationship of text to time is highlighted and becomes part of the pleasurable game with the reader and the narrator. Well, first of all, Let's think about something called intertextuality that I know you've all heard before. Now, you've heard each of those words there, the mental features, discoursed of as the analytical are in themselves, but little susceptible of analysis. You've heard each of them before, and you instantly connect each of those words to 
their meaning, which are located deep in your mind. To, they are located in what I want you to think of as an archive, your textual archive. It's unconscious. You connect the meanings, and did you connect uh, the whole sentence to the archive, to your frameworks of understanding, if you like. It's quite simple, I think. Remember, I asked you to think about what an archive was, and it's a term that we'll be returning to again and again and again. But here it is, I think, for the first time in connection to the concept of time. Instant connection to your own archive. Your understanding depends upon your having an archive, which you gradually build up from infancy to adulthood, um, and uh, certainly throughout adulthood as well. Time, then, perhaps doesn't seem to exist. And yet, narrative depends on form. We could talk, you know what verb means, you know what mental means, you know what features mean, you know what analytical means, and so on and so forth. But it's when they're all put together, then a meaning, a narrative is established. And when that narrative's upset, when the form of the sentence is upset, then the meaning either changes or becomes nonsensical. Look at that. I've rearranged that uh, sentence in alphabetical order. It doesn't mean anything anymore. I've upset the form and therefore the meaning's changed. Think how that works in detective fiction. How what clues we're told about in what order is absolutely fundamental, not just to our pleasure, but to our decoding much more widely. Now, the combination of form and time and the archive that's accessing our different archives over time in a particular way, encouraged by the form of a text, which sounds very complicated, but actually is, is common sense, really, is sometimes called the hermeneutic cycle. I've also heard it called the hermeneutic circle. And in fact, I learned this procedure as the hermeneutic circle, but now it's more commonly called the hermeneutic cycle. And I think that expresses more correctly what's happening. So we encounter a text or a couple of words or a word, and then we interpret it. Then we go on to the next bit of text, and then we interpret the whole text again in a different way, and we add some more of the text, and we reinterpret the text in a different way again. So, for example, we might read a clue or a detail. We access our archive to understand it. We'll move on to the next clue or detail. We'll modify what we think about the text, and we will also have modified our archive, and that's fundamental. Our own archives will have been modified by what we've just learned. Then we'll move on to the another clue or detail, and yet again we'll have a new interpretation of the text, and indeed our whole archive will have been changed as well. So this is an ongoing process. Now, let's return for a moment to this very first sentence of the murders in the Rue Morgue. Poe seems to be claiming that you can't analyse analysis itself. You can only analyse its effect. That means you can only tell a story rather than analyse analysis. You can demonstrate the effects of analysis through a story. Now, I'm refusing that. I'm reading that assertion suspiciously, and I'm rebelling against it rather disobediently. What I'm trying to do here is to analyse the game of detective fiction. I'm trying to detect the traces of how 
detective fiction works. Now, detective fiction relies on hidden stories in a more obvious way, I think, than what I've just been discussing. It's often said that classic detective fiction comprises two stories, that of the crime and that of the investigation, in which the detective tries to discover the story of the crime from a whole series of clues until the detective is finally able to reconstruct the crime in its entirety up to its end point, that is, the crime itself. Curiously, the crime is also the beginning of the story of the investigation. In other words, the investigation is an attempt to discover its own origins, so to speak. But there's also a third narrative, and that is the story of the investigation told by a non-investigator, Dupin's unnamed friend, and Dr. Watson, for example. In other cases, such as in P.D. James's uh, Unsuitable Job for a Woman, this third person who tells the story is a narrator. In others again, like the Raymond Chandler or the Judith Lee stories by Richard Marsh, the narrator may be the detective. And it's the detective who withholds information from us, teases us with new puzzles, flirts with us even by making tiny and temporary gaps in their narrative clothing to make us guess what lies beneath. In other words, the third narrative is the story of our reading, the story of our gradual understanding, of our adding detail to the framework, of adding a bit more text to our archive than another bit of text to our archive. It's exactly what I've just been describing to you in previous slides. Now, detective fiction has been described by Peter Hune as a self-referential genre about writing and reading. And you'll see exactly where I'm coming from uh, in what's uh, just uh, been told to you. In effect, the detective story asks us, says Peter Hune, to treat it suspiciously, just as the detective tries to locate evidence to make a story. We continually have to ask whether a piece of evidence is relevant, whether it fits in with previous elements that we've heard before, whether we can match it up to our whole archive of stories that we've assembled throughout our lives. This is exactly the hermeneutic circle. We are detectives reading the story suspiciously. But in detective fiction, there's also something else. For criminals resemble authors in that they plot first their crimes and then they construct false stories about the crimes by eliminating clues, by planting false ones that initially lead the investigator, the detective and the reader to construct logical but wrong plots. The criminal authors delay the resolution of the story. And this criminal activity on the part of authors is actually part of the convention of the genre. We expect detective fiction to do this to us. We expect to suspect representations. We expect representations to be biased, subjective, misleading, and we expect to have to test what we read against our archive of stories that we've read either previously or that we know from uh, our own experience. It's certainly not a spontaneous outpouring of feeling a la Wordsworth. 
but a calculated flirtation, a power game. This is what Poe meant when he was referring to his game of drafts between two opponents. The narrator and the reader are the fundamental opponents in the game of drafts, which is detective fiction. It's not only the detective and the criminal, it's also the narrator and the reader. And the author, if they're any good, has carefully orchestrated this game for us. Now, the narrator, like the detective, hopes to influence the actions or ideas of their audiences, just curiously, as the criminal tries to cover up the crime and, in so doing, tries to influence the thinking and actions of her or his audience, who is the investigator. It's part of the game, part of the genre, that in the end, the reader and the detective have to win. We, ha we must, in classical uh, detective fiction anyway, uh, solve the mysteries. Even if the narrator and the criminal at times lose control of the story and inadvertently reveal what we, the audience, are encouraged to think of as their true character or action. Just think of the very curious relationship between the anonymous narrator and the Dupin. Why on earth are they living in solitude together in a crumbling mansion and wander the seedy streets of Paris at night, closing the shutters and the curtains to create night during the daytime? Why doesn't the narrator give himself a name? Is he trying both to hide himself and also to reveal himself at the same time? If so, why? If the criminal of the detective formula is an author, then, then the detective must be a reader. Enacting the hermeneutic cycle or circle of textual understanding, adjusting our interpretations as we go along, we detective readers encounter more evidence, trying to read the mind of the criminal until a coherent meaning emerges and we finally arrive at a true story. Detection, then, involves the five other key terms we readers, we reader detectives read texts, which means accessing our mental archives of stories in an ordered sequence of time that we try to guess in a game that we play with the narrator, author, criminal. As you'll certainly have noticed by now, Poe's tale emphasises the detective's identity as a reader. The narrator and Dupin, for example, make their acquaintance in a library, by which Poe means a bookshop. Both narrator and Dupin are in search of the same rare volume. And Dupin is alerted uh, to his case through a newspaper and builds his investigation of the murders uh, on the depositions by witnesses as they reported there. Famously, the object of the centre of another detective tale by Poe, The Purloined Letter, is a text that is openly displayed, but it's disguised through having been turned inside out and readdressed in a different hand. Unlike the reader, Dupin, the agents of the police prefect, the official investigators, fail to find the letter in that story because they look at all of the textual items in the minister's apartment, but crucially, they don't read them. Now, this is exactly 
what Sherlock Holmes and Dupin and all the detectives on this course do, or at least try to do. They seek to read, to interpret evidence. Now, they may use different terms for that. Sherlock Holmes famously uses the term observe. But what's important is that this observation involves openly calling on their mental archives as well as their physical senses. They don't only see, they observe and recall material from their mental archives. As you'll find, for example, the archives can be very literary. The detective Cordelia Gray, in An Unsuitable Job for a Woman, certainly knows her romantic poetry and her contemporary drama and uses her knowledge of those to test evidence and alibis. And it's through those archives that she uncovers the truth. I hope by now that you'll have come to appreciate the connections between these six key terms, these six that I outlined in the first part of this introduction. The question remains, though, whether there's something beyond them that determines how we connect them. This is the question that we'll be exploring in the next stage of our investigation of investigation, our detection of detective fiction, following the tracks of how it works. Is there something beyond these six terms that determines how we connect them.